Thank you. Great. Thank you, Valen. Thank you for the invitation to uh, join you today. Boy, what a couple of great talks. Um, I really learned a lot, um, and I hope maybe I can tie some of that into my talk as well. Um, so I'm on the board of um, Aregio, uh, which is part of Cooper Genomics and Illumina, and uh, research is funded by the March of Dimes. So I'm going to go over what are telomeres and uh, explain how they cap uh, chromosomes, and, and virtually every metazoan has a uh, a challenge where the DNA ends and uh, you need to uh, block uh, a uh, double strand um, break response to that and how they play a central role in genomic aging uh, in, uh, in instability and understand how tel telomeres reset uh, during pre-implantation development early in life and then propose an explanation for uh, how changes in telomere length uh, can regulate the pluripotency uh, and retrotransposon expression. It's a little bit different than some of the work I've done before. So um, just to remind you what telomeres are. Um, so if the chromosome started where I am and wrapped all the way around uh, the room and then ended up here, you'd see you have a fundamental challenge in that it's ending uh, as a blunt end. And uh, there's no way a cell can distinguish a blunt end of a chromosome from a double strand, strand break. Uh, bacteria and viruses have solved that by creating circularization. They circularize the DNA and then create a, 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 a tuck in the end of the chromosome uh, into what is called a, a, a D loop. Well, our chromosomes do the same. And uh, you can see here the, the two strands in blue and orange are, um, are one of the strands is displaced and there's a triple strand, so-called D loop, that tucks in and protects the end from being recognized. Um, and uh, there, this doesn't just happen. It's not like somebody with curly hair where it just sort of rolls up. There are actually uh, regulated processes. That there are six proteins, uh, and they form a complex called shelterin. Uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the entire structure, the loop that ends of every chromosome is called a T-loop or a telomere loop. Uh, and again, it, it avoids uh, the um, DNA damage response. And um, loss of telomere repeats occurs with each DNA division. It's a so-called end replication problem that was postulated when the structure of DNA was first identified. Uh, and the way that DNA replicates, it's asymmetrical with the leading and lagging strand using different mechanism. The Osaka fragment uh, falls off and you get a trimming back each cell cycle. Um, and that's presumably why aging occurs. Uh, where sort of these are the sort of the, the, the um, uh, the grains of sand in the hourglass of time is that we're losing little pieces at the ends of our uh, DNA until we can no longer form that T-loop. Uh, and um, there are two mechanisms by which uh, telomeres can be re um, reconstituted. One of them uh, is in um, most stem cells and progenitor cells in our body. We have an enzyme, uh, telomerase. It's a reverse transcriptase where it can use an RNA template to reverse transcribe on this, um, this repeat, which in the case of most metazoans is TTHEG. Um, interestingly, uh, spermatogonia have very extensive telomerase activity, but oocytes have none, essentially no measurable telomerase activity. There's another mechanism, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it about halfway through the talk, that's called alternative lengthening of telomeres, and um, we identified this as occurring early in development. It's a, a telomerase independent, method that is much less efficient uh, and also uh, creates a lot of um, genomic instability. So we'll be going over that. Just to give you a little bit more detail, especially apropos to the two talks we just heard, um, this is what the shelter looks like. Remember the six canonical proteins that um, actively form that telomere loop. Uh, one of these, TIN2, actually binds specifically SA, uh, SA1, which is the, the telomeric cohesions, uh, and it provides a kind of a, um, a, a, ba a band around the, the telomeric ends, um, which is very interesting to Mary's um, uh, discussion about uh, the importance of subtelomeric crossover events, and I can imagine how uh, the, S the, the telomeric uh, uh, um, cohesions would be very challenged by that, especially if the telomeres have already shortened and there's very little tin two to, bo to bind um, uh, the, um, the telomeric cohesions, although I'm not going to specifically talk about cohesions. Recently, um, a number of studies have come out, mainly in the cancer field, about how uh, 
genomic instability occurs in cancer, which is as the telomeres get depleted with age, most cancers in adults increase markedly with age, is you lose that telomeric loop, you lose that um, ability to block uh, uh, DNA damage response, and so you get a, um, uh, a, a non-homologous end joining, where literally the ends of telomeres fuse, uh, and then there's a, a process of um, uh, of um, re resolution of this, which involves chromothripsis, which is a fragmentation of the, of the chromosome followed by reconstitution. Um, and we'll show a little bit at the end how some of this may explain not only the aneuploidy we see, but the extensive genomic rearrangements we see, um, not necessarily increasing with age, but ubiquitous throughout um, uh, uh, human reproduction, early development. So telomeres shorten with age, as I mentioned, they're, uh, we're depleting every time we divide a cell. Um, and as I mentioned, whereas spermatic gonia have extensive telomerase activity, uh, oocytes have next to none. This is from the group that uh, were the first to look at human telomerase activity, uh, Woody Wright and Jerry Shea, and they looked at human oocytes, uh, ova, eggs, um, one cell, two cell, up to blast, and if you measure telomerase as an activity or if you look at it uh, as an expression of the <coughs> regulated subunit of telomerase, it's almost unmeasurable until you get to the blast stage of development. So essentially, oocytes are endowed with the telomere length that they developed um, before they left the assembly line back and the production line back in phyloogenesis, uh, which is amazing. In fact, uh, we and others showed that oocytes um, decline with age. Um, the telomere length in oocytes decline with age, but many others have shown that in sperm, telomere length not only does not decline, it actually elongates. Telomeres get longer in, in sperm. And again, I, I, didn't, I didn't make that rule. It just seems to be very ubiquitous uh, and very unfair for, for those who think about the philosophy of reproduction. Over the last 14 years, we've um, uh, done a number of studies that reviewed down the bottom. We'll give some of the uh, references that, uh, and, 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 and he argued how in a mouse model it re that we can phenocopy reproductive aging in, uh, that occurs in women. Uh, as you know, uh, mice have a very, very marginal uh, oocyte aging. It occurs, uh, aging in the mouse occurs largely in the uterus, in the brain, and um, while the prior two speakers have done really terrific work with uh, Looking at the mouse model, it's uh, quite challenging in that it's uh, very, very little aneuploidy, very little um, uh, reproductive aging. I remember the first time I read this, I started this work, uh, the studies had shown that you can take even a 15-month-old mouse and mate it, and you'll actually get fertile uh, offspring. And uh, I just didn't believe it, so I, I reconstituted that. I re repeated that experiment. It was exactly true. <laughs> they have very little... Uh, you can do a uh, donation model where you take oocytes from very old mice and put them into pseudo-pregnant young recipients, and it's true. They have a remarkable resilience in their uh, oocyte capacity. On the other hand, you can create a um, mouse uh, model for reproductive aging by uh, disrupting the telomeres. They have telomeres about 10 times longer than humans. Uh, and as you shorten the telomeres, in this case genetically, you can do it pharmacologically, uh, you can explain many of the phenomena that have, been, uh, explain, that have been invoked to explain the reproductive aging that occurs at the oocyte level in the human. For example, I remember when I presented this talk one time and Bob Ed Edwards was in the audience and he came running up afterwards, he said, that's it? You know, he had published a couple of papers arguing that there was a production line, that the first oocytes that exit the oogonial proliferative phase um, are actually the, the first uh, that ovulate in the female, this using um, tritium labeling, and BRDU labeling, and several others had replicated this experiment, but it was hard to put it together. How does the, o the ovary know that the oocytes that had um, uh, exited latest from this replicative phase of oogenesis are the last to ovulate? And, um, and, and uh, it, this would explain it if there's a, a clock ticking for each replication uh, then this would explain it. Um, we had uh, um, done an experiment uh, in which we looked at the effect of telomere attrition on the formation of chiasma and also synapsis. And 
Um, uh, this is originally proposed by Terry Hassel to be important, and the human and others had shown that it's very important in, uh, all the way from yeast to mice. And in the work that's reviewed in the uh, uh, in the review there, we, we published in PNAS uh, that this marked reduction of chiasma and uh, synapsis, these uh, very important elements of the uh, recombination apparatus as we shorten the telomeres. Uh, and interestingly, um, as you shorten the telomeres, there's a very marked disruption of meiotic spindles. The meiotic spindles, as you know, in the case of meiosis, largely nucleate off the off the, um, the, the, the chromosomes themselves. And uh, at the recent Cold Spring Harbor meeting on telomeres, there are at least half a dozen papers showing that the telomeres actually have um, remarkable elements of uh, kinetochores. You can find many of the same proteins occurring at the, the telomeres that occur at the, um, at the centromeres and uh, form kinetochore-like structures. So you have um, many of the same things. And this is probably why uh, this, the meiotic uh, spindle is disrupted as we shorten telomeres. Uh, and why potentially even low levels of mitochondrial DNA deletions and reactive oxygen can disrupt um, reproduction. The, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, structure of the, of the telomere is very GC rich, guanine rich. And guanine, of all the nucleotides, is like a sponge. It soaks reactive oxygen. It's um, absorbent, it's very reactive. To, to the stress of reactive oxygen. And uh, as you shorten telomeres, you get increase in uh, apoptosis uh, as the cells self-destruct, and you also get uh, fragmentation uh, as they, uh, they uh, self-destruct. So all that was in mice, and we've been working on that for, say, for about 14 years. But the question of what about humans uh, came about. So um, we'd been looking for some time um, to f identify a human mutation in telomerase. We use a telomerase knockout in the mice, so there must be natural, um, natural examples of this occurring in humans. And in fact, that we were referred by NIH to uh, a woman who uh, uh, was um, uh, sent to us uh, to, because we've been looking for some time for uh, someone who's interested in looking at their reproductive status um, while experiencing the, the uh, disruptive effects of telomeropathy. This woman had a mutation in her telomerase gene which induces precocious aging. Um, this is literally what she looks like. She's Scandinavian, uh, had very fair skin, and had, uh, she's 30 years old and looked like she was about 50, uh, had uh, a lot of other extensive abnormalities, including her bone marrow. Um, but look at her reproductive system. Uh, the normal age-matched uh, patient with, um, uh, in that age group, we would expect an anti-mullerian hormone level to be between one and three, and hers was 0 0.3. Uh, this is, uh, DKC is dyskeratosis congenita, which is the, the name given to this. Um, and, and despite her being 30 years old, uh, she had a very low level, about 10 times lower than expected. Uh, she wanted to go through um, uh, embryo banking so we ended up doing a controlled ovarian stimulation cycle and used triple the dose uh, for almost twice the amount of stimulation uh, and got about half the number, a third of the number of oocytes that we would typically expect. Uh, had a very low fertilization rate and only one of her embryos reached uh, the um, stage of blast when we typically freeze. Uh, when we looked at the telomeres in her embryos, you can see the normal embryos uh, had much longer, these were unaffected embryos um, from control patients that are age matched, had much longer telomeres than those developed from this woman. But the, it begs the question, if she had next to no telomerase activity, her telomerase activity was about four standard deviations below uh, the, the norm for uh, someone her age, uh, and how would she have any development at all? And uh, this harkens back to the, so, some work we had done previously. If there's very little telomerase activity at the beginning of life and the embryo begins uh, life with short telomeres inherited from the oocyte, how does it lengthen? How do we reset telomeres? Um, and we had shown that there's this alternative lengthening of telomeres uh, that had been previously reported to occur in, um, in some rare tumors, sarcomas, solid tumors. Uh, most tumors, by the way, um, eventually turn their telomerase back on and uh, form a, a kind of immortality from uh, expressing continuously telomerase, this reverse transcriptase that can reconstitute telomeres. But certain tumors, particularly from uh, post-mitotic cells, uh, brain tumors, uh, sarcomas, uh, use this, um, this 
uh, recombination-based method. Uh, and so we published a number of years ago that uh, the telomere lengthening early in development follows the same method, the same approach. So if you can look, this is looking at telomere length in oocytes. This is in a, in a, in a mouse model. Uh, and then if you look at what happens, um, even though there's next to no telomerase activity early in development, um, that you can see marked telomere lengthening, uh, even in the absence of appreciable telomerase activity. And this occurs even in parthenos, because you could argue, okay, the sperm is adding a telomere, and so on average, there's an increase uh, that is um, independent of what's happening in the oocyte. But you can see even in parthenos, even in telomerase null mice, these are mice in which there's essentially, um, been, the telomerase activity has been knocked out, and you can see, um, the wild type here in, in white, and then uh, two, two generations, the first generation and the third generation following the telomerase null status. And in each case, you find a marked telomere elongation, even in the absence of telomerase. Both the absence because so physiologically it's turned off, and in this case, um, essentially genetically we've, uh, we've removed it, and you still get extensive telomere elongation. And this is published data, but I just want to quickly point out that um, there's extensive telomere sister chromatid exchange as measured by a, a co-fish method. Uh, and you find um, extensive uh, evidence of DNA double strand break repair. There's, there's expression of RAD50 bloom and then Werner proteins uh, during the cleavage stage, which, we, which is during this time when we see the telomere lengthening. Uh, and then by the time we get to blast, it's pretty much turned off. You can see that these co-localized, these proteins co-localized specifically or preferentially anyway, to telomeres. Um, what about humans? All this work had been done initially in mice. So we found the same uh, evidence of uh, telomere lengthening uh, in humans, even though, again, the, there's very little telomerase expression, very little expression of the, of the reverse transcriptase uh, present in humans. Um, and uh, you find the kind of the hallmarks of uh, alternative lengthening, which is extensive increase in variability. So not only do you find the mean telomere length, or the, in this case, the median telomere length uh, going up, but you see the error bars, the confidence uh, intervals increasing extensively, and this is one of the hallmarks of alternative lengthening, where this recombination-based lengthening is creating extensive heterogeneity among telomeres. Uh, we also did this in a parthenogenic model, taking human oocytes and then activating them. And once again, you see both an increase in telomere length, independent of telomerase, but you see it uh, also in accompanied by increased heterogeneity. The, the, the uh, confidence intervals are uh, increased um, markedly. So w w what's going on here? What, what is the impact of such robust lengthening of telomeres? Well, uh, it's widely um, known in uh, a number of model systems, including yeast in fly, that uh, there's a, a telomere position effect that um, the length of the telomere, the number of these repeats, can influence the uh, the, um, uh, the transcription of genes that lay close. Uh, and just below, the, the telomeres themselves encode essentially no genes. But the subtelomeric region just below the telomeres is rich in genes that are very important for development. So this telomere position effect that was first described in yeast um, had been shown to be active in mammalian cells and cultured cells, um, including human. So um, we sought to look whether this could also happen uh, in, in, in during early development. So just to remind you, uh, so telomeres themselves don't code genes, but they have the capacity to lay down heterochromatin in this gene-rich region uh, just below uh, the telomeres. Uh, and uh, they're both um, uh, classic, so-called classic telomere position effect that occurs uh, to, in genes that are proximate. And then uh, there's also telomere looping where they can move even further, megabyte bases away from the, uh, from the telomere and lay down heterochromatin. In doing so, close the chromatin, reduce the transcription of these very important genes. So we do, looked at a telomerase null uh, model uh, as, as a way to study uh, this telomere position effect, you can just show, and uh, you can see on the on the right that gel is uh, uh, essentially a telomerase activity assay, and you can see that when you uh, make the the, uh, the cells null for uh, for the uh, uh, telomerase activity, you get much shorter telomeres. 
Uh, and look what happens when we shorten the telomeres in these uh, embryonic cells. You can see marked expression of a really interesting gene. This, comes, this came off of a RNA-seq experiment where we just looked to see when we compared short versus long telomeres in the same embryonic cells whether there was a change of any important genes. And the one that immediately jumped out is Z-Scan4, which is a fascinating gene because this regulates totipotency during the two-cell state of the mouse. In fact, the gene was first identified in a, uh, look at, in a scan for genes that are um, first turned on at the two-cell. And um, in addition, uh, there's a marked increase in DUX, which regulates Z-Scan4. Uh, and so you can see in the wild type, and then as we shorten the telomeres, marked increase in this very, very important uh, set of two genes that are essentially turning on the, uh, the, um, the uh, totipotency genes that make the blastomeres essentially totipotent. Recall that by the time they get to the, the blastist stage, they'll become pluripotent and they'll gradually reduce their potency. In addition, um, the telomere shortening led to activation of a number of really interesting uh, molecules that are uh, actually ancient retroviruses that have infected our genome. About 40% of our genome consists of repetitive elements that have been sort of shut down by cytosine methylation uh, um, and over billions of years have become part of our uh, genome uh, and, and are very important, we now know, uh, for promoters and enhancers, um, and a number of these remain active. In uh, the case of the human line one, there are about 100 copies of line one, uh, and you can see that that was significantly increased. And in the case of the, this is a mouse, uh, there are uh, two uh, important retroviruses that are both uh, markedly turned on. Uh, tomorrow, I have a whole section where I'm gonna talk about what we've been doing with retroviruses, um, which we're pretty excited. We think that some of the, the, the genomic instability that is not at the chromosome level, but is a copy number, copy number variant level, and potentially even at mosaicism, may be related to the genomic activity driven by the activation of, um, of still uh, mobile uh, elements. Um, and what's interesting is that the transposal elements that were closest to the telomeres, these are of course all mapped um, in the mouse and human genomes, those that were within uh, one megabyte base, in this case, were uh, much more affected. You can see line one, long terminal repeat and sign um, were um, regulated um, and then there were some that were downregulated. Whereas when you get out to uh, 20 megabase, uh, the, there was there was less uh, uh, activity, suggesting that this is potentially uh, looking at the classic telomere position effect. In addition, we looked at epigenetic re regulators of transposable elements. Uh, this is um, H3. Uh, K9 ME3. We also looked at some of the others. Um, this is just an example where you can see uh, with the um, uh, shortening of the telomeres, which leads to the upregulation of these very important totipotency genes, that we have a uh, reduction of the repressive chromatin configuration. So this suggests that as these telomeres are shortening, not only are there these genomic instability issues in non-homologous and joining the risk of uh, chromosomes. Um, uh, fusing uh, aneuploidy that halts the, the uh, embryonic development. But in addition, um, there are these uh, very significant changes that are going on uh, to uh, very important totipotency genes, including um, uh, DUX, uh, Z-Scan4, Z uh, and, and some of the, uh, uh, the retrotransposons. So just to wrap it up, um, telomeres, as we discussed, protect the chromosome ends, and they shorten with age, even in long-lived cells, such as oocytes. They're essential in meiosis and early embryo development, as well as in mice. Um, they, um, and deep protection of the telomeres, as they uh, shorten through attrition, um, triggers non-homologous end joining, non-disjunction, and or chromothripsis uh, that are contributing presumably to the copy number variants, and I didn't show you all the data for that, it's a different talk. Uh, but the telomeres, both in mouse and human, increase dramatically, and it's kilobases, not base pairs, kilobases through this, um, through this uh, uh, recombination-based method, uh, and that this may be essential, this may be one of the key regulators early in life of the, the uh, totipotency that occurs first up to the uh, beginning of pluripotency as the uh, genes um, are, uh, that are in the subtelomeric region that are uh, regulating development are um, regulated by heterochromatin being laid down by the relative length of the telomere which is changing across development. So again, um, thank you for your attention. 
I hope you have some questions, and uh, I really enjoyed the meeting so far. Yes, please. So as far as, uh, so I, I'm really puzzled about something you said, because um, Z-Scan 4 was originally defined in ES cells as evolved in lengthening telomeres through a telomerase. Could, could you speak a little closer to yeah. yeah, so Z-Scan 4 was originally identified in ES cells as involved in lengthening telomeres via telomerase activity. Yeah. And, and the idea behind the totipotency um, model is that ES cells need to go through a 2C-like state so they can lengthen their telomeres and then they become totipotent. Yet, you're saying that activation of 2Cs, which I think it's really interesting that yeah. it's responding to shortening telomeres, but activation of 2C is occurring in a system where you're not in development where there's no telomerase activity, which suggests that this phenomenon in ES cells and the embryo is actually very different, and I'm really interested yeah, in your yeah. views on that. Yeah, it's a fascinating question. Tomorrow, I hope you'll be able to, if I talk tomorrow, I'll have a little bit more discussion about this, but we think that there's, because we also um, looked at this and did find some effects. By the way, the effects on telomere activity are very variable, um, and, and the telomerase, of course, at least early in development, um, is almost not existent, right? So it would be surprising if the effects were the same. In other words, if Z-Scan 4, uh, effects of um, uh, its action on telomere length by activating telomerase, but telomerase is shut down, uh, you know, it would be hard yeah. to imagine, you know, uh, a s situation we find suppression uh, of telomerase activity. So it's not surprising, I don't think, that it would be different. Um, and as you know, in ES cells, there's only like one, two, three percent of cells that are in this two cell state at any given time expressing Z scan 4. So Physiologically, I think what's happening physiologically, when you look at the two cell state, when there's very little telomerase activity, it's a different dynamic. There's a different relationship between Z-Scan or, but I think it is dynamic. I suspect that they're going back and forth where they're sort of communicating, where the telomere shortening is activating the Z-Scan 4, which itself is then starting uh, the, the seeds of the end of that stage of development, because very rapidly it moves into, the, even by the four cell stage, you can already see it changing in the telomeres, um, the longer telomeres shutting it down. So, I mean, one of the things we think, I mean, so our lab was, so we were the first to really show single cell totipotency in an ESL. Um, and uh, when we published this, we argued that it is co-expression of these 2C transcripts with, with um, embryonic and extraembryonic transcription, which fits more with sort of late Moriola blastocyst stage. And I, don't, I wonder, is that a point at which you see telomerase activity becoming active? Exactly, that's right. Mm -hmm. So late Mor Moriola, early blast, and it comes up very, very rapidly and very robustly. So the, the, the sort of uh, um, uh, physiological state uh, in the two cell itself, there's next to no telomerase activity, so it would be surprised, yeah. So I think that's uh, the, how you reconcile the differences. Uh, we have time for one question, Mary, and then we'll break. Thanks, David. That was a really nice talk. I just, I hate to bring it all back to cohesion, but there was a paper published earlier this year from Rolf Yesberger's lab where he showed that the meiosis-specific cohesion subunit SMC1 beta is required to maintain intact telomeres in spermatocytes. Yes. And I think it would be really interesting to look at interactions between telomeres and the cohesion. Complex. Oh, I think so very much, Mary, because um, uh, the, 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 there's a lot of um, uh, movement in the telomere field um, towards showing uh, the importance of the telomeres uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, non-disjunction. And, and so the fact that there's very specific telomeres uh, for meiosis and for the telomeres uh, makes it a, a very ripe uh, project to be able to bring together these uh, different approaches. Uh, it, it's interesting that we should have a telomere talk and a cohesion talk as if they're competing. <laughs> but my guess is that there, there's a reconciliation of these mm -hmm. in which uh, the, these things are all, you know, the way biology works, as you know, and especially medicine, it's not sort of like 
pool, you know, where like one pool ball hits the next, hits the next. They're all moving interaction. So I suspect uh, that there's a very important role, particularly as you lose telomere length, uh, there, there's a reduction. There's a, just a, there's a kind of a counting with each telomere repeat. Uh, there's a certain number of TRF1s, TRF2s, and TIN2s, TIN2 being the, the part of the shelter that binds the cohesion. So it's the hypothesis that your idea uh, generates is that um, as you get telomere shortening, it'll be reduced into reduced cohesion um, at the telomeric end <coughs> with increased separation. Um, we, in fact, published something on this a few years ago, but, but we didn't follow it as much as we should have. I think it's uh, the work you're doing is, is for spot on with this and would be very interesting to, and you know, this telomerase knockout mouse is commercially available. You get it from Jackson Lab. Uh, and uh, so um, it's, I think it's a great idea. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you very much.